Have you ever been in a situation in your life at a time when you thought you had a really good plan, only to find out that your really good plan turned out to be a pretty bad plan? I think we could all probably think back to some situations where we thought we went into something with a good plan, only to see it backfire later. I don't know about you guys, but I'm just fascinated by this. Every July, I watch the National Hot Dog Eating Contest. Any of you guys watch this? It's the most ridiculous thing ever, right? But there's this guy, Joey Chestnut, and he's famous for eating hot dogs. I mean, talk about being famous for something. He's famous for eating hot dogs. So every, around every 4th of July, they have this hot dog eating contest. And uh, we've got a picture to show you here. Joey Chestnut and, and, and a group of people stand up there and they eat as many hot dogs as they can in 10 minutes. Do you know what the record, what the record of number of hot dogs eaten is? 76 hot dogs in 10 minutes. 76 hot dogs in 10 minutes. Now, I'm imagining the first time Joey Chestnut went into this hot dog eating contest, he had a really good plan. And after 10 minutes and 76 hot dogs, he thought, that was a really bad idea. Yet, for some reason, he keeps doing it. So maybe it was a good plan. But I think we all have those times when we have these plans we think are great, but on the other side, we find out they weren't so great. Now, I don't know about you, but I love office pranks. Anybody else love office pranks? Back in, in my time of working in a big corporate office, I, anytime I could, I could dare somebody or, or even pay them to do an office prank, it was always a, a really good day. It was always really fun. Now, I don't want you, though. Office pranks often start pretty harmless, right? It starts with something like just decorating a coworker's cubicle with David Hasselhoff pictures. <laughs> you know, just something kind of fun. Um, you know, it just starts pretty harmless, but then it seems to escalate. And this is when the plan goes wrong. You know, you, you, you get a little braver and you start to decorate the, the office in aluminum foil. You know, it takes a little more time. But you know your plan went wrong when you get the saran wrap out and you head to the bathroom. That's when things go way off the rails. And what started as a good plan turned out to be uh, probably written up, maybe, you know, some even some harsh words from your boss. I mean, it tended to turn out pretty bad. Now, we can joke about office pranks, but I think we've all been in situations in life where we think we've got a great plan. We, we think we have all the details. We think we know what's best, and we find ourselves in a place where it backfires, and we realize that our plan wasn't very good to start with. You know, I think it comes down to the reality that making decisions in life is hard. And so how do we become better at making decisions? Because I think we've all been in a place, whether it was work, it was a relationship, you said, I, I think there's something better for me out there. And so maybe you're in a job that you really liked and you said, you know, what I really want is to do this. And I think I have the skills to do it. So I'm going to take that risk on myself and I'm going to jump out and do it only to find out that it didn't work out and you should have stayed where you were before. I think people have done this with relationship, and you maybe are, are, are dating somebody that you think uh, it seems to be a really good fit, but, but, but you just, there, there's something unrealistic that you have a desire for, so you end that relationship to try to find a new one only to find out that you made a mistake. I think we can all look back in life and realize that we have thought we had a good plan only for it to turn out bad. And so I guess one of the questions we have to learn to ask is, how do we become better at making decisions? And, and to, to get down below the surface, why do we struggle at making decisions? And I think one of the reasons that we are not great decision makers comes back to one of our greatest weaknesses and our greatest faults. And that is not your irrational fear of balloons or your love of gas station sushi. It's the belief that we know what is best for our life, that we think that we can do things better, and that we can chart the course to where our life needs to go. And you guys know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the P word, pride. You know, Benjamin Franklin once said this about pride. He said, there is perhaps no one of our natural passions so hard to subdue as pride. Beat it down, stifle it, mortify it as much as one pleases. It is still alive. Even if I could conceive that I had completely overcome it, I should probably be proud of my humility. And how true is that? Oh, man, I'm the most humble person you've ever met. I'm just so proud of it. Pride is something that impacts us all. It hits all, it hit, it hits all of us. It's what uh, the, the reformer Martin Luther called uh, the, the fact that we're all curved inward. And no matter what situation we're in life, when it comes to decision making, we often have pride cloud the way we see ourselves. See, pride is dangerous because pride clouds our judgment. 
Pride is dangerous because pride gives us uh, an overconfidence in, in who we are, an overconfidence in ourselves, and it also causes us to overstate our ability. And I think you can probably all look back at a time in your life when pride caused you to do something you now regret. Or it caused you to think too highly of yourself in a situation and you were humbled. And I, for me, I feel like this is a cycle that has gone over and over and again. And it all starts back when I was playing middle school baseball. So uh, let me just tell you a quick story. It was middle school baseball and I was on a select team and I was feeling pretty good about myself. And I had a really good spring. I was hitting well. I was feeling well. And the first lineup came out to start the season. And I was hitting leadoff in player center field, playing center field. And I was ready to go ahead and get my own trophy. I was feeling really good about myself. But then I hit a slump. And for any of you baseball players, you know the slump is the dagger into the soul. But I was so overconfident in my skills that I didn't go to the cages and I didn't work on it. I just figured it would work its way out. And by the end of the year, I'm batting ninth and I'm playing left out. And I was destroyed because of it. I feel like that cycle, I don't know about you, but I feel like that cycle of overconfidence and humility, being humbled by life, has just been a cycle in my life over and over again. Pride is dangerous, and you've probably experienced it too. But one of the really most dangerous things I think that pride does is pride causes us to miss what God is doing, and what God is calling us to do. Because pride causes me to think that my way is better than God's way, and when I think my way is better than God's way, then my way gets in the way. And this is what we're going to see today as we get into the book of Genesis. Pride causes us to think that our way is better than God's way, and every time it leads us to a place where we see consequences, but not just consequences for me, consequences for you. So turn with me, Genesis chapter 11. If you've been with us the past couple of months, we're camped out in the book of Genesis, and we're seeing that God is revealing to us how we got to where we are. And so we've been walking through uh, Genesis 1 through now chapter 11, and we see that God created everything, and he, and he calls it good, and God gives Adam and Eve a home in the garden, and then we see in Genesis 3 something bad happens. We have the fall. We see everything changes because sin enters the world, and it escalates quickly. We have the first murder, we have polygamy, we have all these things. And we get to Genesis chapter 6, with Darren, which Darren taught, did a great job of teaching about the flood last week. And we see that God sees there's only one family left in the world that seeks him. There's only one righteous person left in the world, as the Bible tells us, and that's Noah and Noah's family. Everybody else has gone so far off the rails, they've missed it. They've lost it. And so God decides he has to do something that he never wanted to do. And he has to hit reset. And we see the flood. And so last week we had this really dark time in, 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 hum, in human history. We have the flood. But then on the other side of the flood, now we have Noah and Noah's family. And God tells Noah the same thing he told Adam and Eve. He said, go and have babies and move all over the world. Be fruitful and multiply because the mission I give you is the same mission I gave them. And that's to go and manage and, and, and lead, be my image bearers all over this beautiful world I've made. And so now we have Noah's, uh, we, we, in chapter 9 and chapter 10, we have the list of Noah's grandkids. And we see Noah's grandkids now have this opportunity to set things right. But then we come to Genesis chapter 11. And we see that Noah's grandkids, rather than looking back and saying, hey, our grandparents messed this up, let's do it right. They fall into the same trap of thinking that they know what's better than God. And letting pride overwhelm who they are and their abilities and their estimation of how good they are. And it leads them to do something that changes humanity. And you and I feel the aftershock of it still today. So let's look here in Genesis chapter 11. You know, one of the motifs we see throughout the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis is that God is trying to explain to us why we are where we are. So you're going to notice that when we get to chapter 12 next week, we start to see God call Abram, Abraham, that, that there's a shift in God's approach to the rest of the book of Genesis. But the first 11 chapters, what God is doing is he's telling us why things are the way they are. So you guys have questions. We all have these big questions like, why are we here? How did we get here? Why is this world such a mess? That's what Genesis 1 through 11 is answering. And so if you've ever wondered, why are there so many languages in the world? 
There's 7,000 of them, by the way. 7,000 different languages. You ever wondered, why is there so many languages? And why do people look differently? Why do people uh, have different cultures? Well, Genesis chapter 11 and the story of the Tower of Babel, it tells us. But I want to be careful. See, a lot of times people look at Genesis 11 and they look at it as uh, an allegory for the moral of the story. Or they look at Genesis 11 as a fairy tale. It's this cute bedtime story we tell our kids when they ask, well, how come so-and-so in class doesn't speak English? Or how come when we went on that trip or we saw that YouTube video, these people spoke a different language? But I want you to see that Genesis 11 is not a fairy tale. Genesis 11, these first 11 chapters of the book of the Bible, these are a real messy stories where God is peeling back and saying, look, things are the way they are because of these reasons. And we're going to see today that in Genesis chapter 11, it's one of the most pivotal pivotal stories in the Bible right after the flood of how man continues to let pride guide rather than God. So let's look here and let's see what God has to teach us here as we uh, unpack this story of the Tower of Babel. Genesis chapter 11, starting in verse 1. Let's read together. It says, Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. Let's just stop for a quick second just to give you some uh, geographical references. So the place of Shinar is what we think of as modern-day Iraq. So here's a little bit of a map to kind of show you to make some sense of uh, the plains of Shinar. And so this is the place where Noah's grandkids have settled. So they get off the ark, Noah's uh, grandkids, they start having babies. Babies, they started having a family, and they begin to move and settle in the plains of Shinar. Now, don't miss what's going on here. Don't miss what's, what's happening in the story. God told Noah, hey, Noah and your family, go have babies and move. Go have babies and fill the earth, multiply the earth, and have dominion over all this beautiful mountains and oceans and rivers and all of these things that I created. Go and live there. But notice, they didn't listen. Instead, they migrated east, or they migrated from the east to these plains of Shinar. And so now they're in these plains of Shinar, and they're settling together And what we assume is a metropolis, is a, a mega city. Now, we live in a big city in Denver. And you might say, well, what's wrong with a big city? And I don't think there's anything wrong with a big city. In fact, you need big cities. Otherwise, the chili peppers would never go on tour. And you know you got to have enough tickets to fill stadiums, right? <laughs> like, you need big cities. Like, God loves big cities too. But that wasn't God's plan for these people. See, God's plan for these people was to go and fill the earth and to move to all these beautiful places and, and to, to care for it. And so by them going to the big city, what, what they're saying is that, that, God, my plan for my life is better than your plan for my life. God's like, I want you guys to go, and I want you guys to, to have babies and have families and create cultures and build towns and build cities and build barbecue restaurants and farm and ranch and do all these things. And they say, nah, we know what's better. We're going to build one really big city because we know what's best for us. Notice what they said. Verse 3. And they said to one another, come, let us make, make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and butamen for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top into the heavens. And let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the earth. Okay, now, do you see the problem? The bricks aren't the problem. They say, we're going to make bricks. We're going to have all these things. They got new technology. This is exciting. They're going to build cities. The bricks weren't the problem. The cities weren't the problem. The problem was that they said, God, my way is better than yours. See, that's pride. See, they wanted to make a name for themselves. Do you see it there in verse 4? They're saying they want to make a name for themselves. They want to show off how great they are. Why? Do you catch that? So they don't have to scatter. Do you see what they're doing here? They're saying, we're going to show God that we are so good, that we are so strong, that we are so awesome, that God will never send another flood, even though God promised he wouldn't flood again. They say, God, we're going to show God that we have it so together, that we are so awesome, that we are so incredible that he ne- won't make us scatter. Do you see it? They're trying to show God how good they can be. They're trying to show God how awesome they are. See, this is what pride does. Notice this. Pride blinds us to think that we know 
what is better for us than God does. See, pride pulls that, just puts blinders on you. And you fail to see that God has a plan for your life. And what God's plan for your life is, is better. See, notice the pride. God, we know what's best. And let's be honest. We can laugh at that and say, that's ridiculous. I mean, obviously, what, why would you guys just stay in one city? You've got this beautiful place, and why would you stay there? You, know, you guys got beautiful mountains and rivers and valleys and all over the world. And we can laugh at that and say, why would you do that? But to them, they thought that they were great, and they wanted to show how great they were. And, and although we can laugh at this, how often do, do we do this in our own lives? So I think we do all the time. We may not even realize it. God tells us over and over what's best for us, but yet over and over we respond to what God says is best by saying, thanks, God, but I know what's best. Yeah, God, I realize you're the one that created everything, but guess what? I got this figured out. I'm pretty good, if you haven't noticed. So I think over and over again this happens. See, God tells us in his word what's best for us. He tells us that we should be part of a church, that we should be part of a, of a Christian community where we can do life together. We say, yeah, God, I know you say that. That sounds good, but the reality is I need to focus on work. Because right now I'm trying to make a name for myself. You know, oh, God, I realize that you're telling me in your word that I shouldn't date or marry somebody that isn't a believer. But, God, I'm pretty, I'm, I'm pretty great. I, I think I can get them saved. I'm going to bring them to church with me. Don't worry. They'll, they'll get saved later. Or, God, I know that you're telling me that I need to be living open-handed and be generous with what you have given me. But, God, you don't understand. I'm trying to build up my retirement account. I'm trying to buy that new house. I'm trying to go on that vacation. I'm trying to do these things because I know that's what I need right now. You ever said any of those things or something like it? I know I have. See, pride has that way of sneaking in and causing us to think what we want and need is more important than what God thinks we actually need. And when we do that, forefront, listen up, we're building a Tower of Babel. Where in your life are you building a Tower of Babel right now by thinking that you know what is better for you than God does. Where in your life right now is pride speaking? You may not even realize it. So here in this, in this, uh, this account of the Tower of Babel, you got Noah's grandkids saying, let's build this tower all the way to the heavens. Now, a lot of scholars don't think that they were actually trying to build a tower to heaven. That what they were talking about was, we're going to build a great tower into the heavens, up into the sky. So when people look up, they see how great we are. We are. That they see this tower, this, this beautiful structure, and they go, wow, those people are great. Or, or how, wow, look how awesome we are because of how big this building is. Now, now if you've ever been around a, a giant skyscraper, you know they are pretty impressive. Anybody ever been to Chicago to see Sears Tower or, or Willis Tower? It, it's, it's incredible just to stand there and, and look up. And I went one time, I was in Chicago, and it was a cloudy day, and the clouds broke about the second tier there, and, and it just went into... The heavens is absolutely beautiful, and it shows the power of these structures, right? You think you get people to come together, technology and all these things, to build these beautiful structures. And so that was their plan. We're going to build Willis Tower, and everybody's going to see how awesome we are. Now, when you look back at, at archaeology and you um, see how these, these, these things come together, you, you, could, you could understand. I mean, these guys didn't have cranes. and They didn't have all these things. They were building it with bricks and, and mortar. They were going to, when they did it, it would be something they'd be proud of. Like when I build my daughter's Ikea dresser. You guys ever built an Ikea dresser? You know, it comes in a really big box, and you're like, oh, yeah, I got this. You pull it out, and, and then, of course, you got all those little wooden dowel rods, and next thing you know, the bulldog's eating them, and you're fishing them out of his mouth, and you're, you're ra racing all over the house to, to grab the little, the little lock pieces that your kids took. And by the time you actually get it built, you realize you built the drawer wrong, so you have to build it, unbuild it, build it, unbuild it, right? And you need to get the glue because now you can't get it all to fit together. But when you're done, when it's done, you look at it and you go, yeah, that's right. I did that. That was me. You know you feel a sense of pride. You guys know you do too. Don't lie. I know you guys feel the same way. Like you feel good when you build something, and this is what they wanted. We're going to build this. We're going to feel good about ourselves. We're going to show how great we are. But it ends up backfiring. Now, I want to just talk really quick about this tower. Now, um, this tower was going to be a symbol of their power, right? And so uh, what many uh, archaeologists will point back to and say that this tower was going to be a ziggurat. Somebody say ziggurat. So a ziggurat was like a pyramid-type uh, temple, and it was used for worship back in the ancient Near East. And actually, interestingly, you'll see these ziggurats all over the world. 
which fits in with what we see in our story today. And so these ziggurats were a pyramid-like structure. we got a picture to show you. This is the picture of the ziggurat in Chichen Itza, Mexico. If you guys have been there in the Yucatan in Mexico, this is where the Mayans would worship their Mayan gods. And so you'll see it's a pyramid-like structure with a flat top. And at the top is where they would offer sacrifices to their pagan gods. And they would invite their gods down. And so uh, we see these all throughout, um, throughout the world. Well, uh, many scholars think that they were building this ziggurat. And we don't know if there was any pagan god worship or anything like that at this point with Noah's grandkids. But what we know is they wanted to build this tower to show off how great they were. And, and um, what we have found is archaeologists think they have actually found the Tower of Babel. Here's a picture of it. This is in Erudu, Iraq. Eridu, Iraq. And so they think that this actually was the ziggurat that they were building. It's been added on to and things over the years that they're actually building in the Tower of Babel. It's really interesting. You can look it up online and, and find out more info on it. But they wanted to make a name for themselves. So in Genesis 11, they say, we have this plan and we think it's going to be great. But like any great plan that is opposite of what God's plan is, it's always going to fail. Just like we said a few weeks ago, when you go against the grain of the universe, you're going to get splinters. And we're going to see that the people here in Genesis chapter 11 get splinters. Look at verse 5. It says this, And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of man had built. Okay, now this is kind of satire. Anybody love the onion? Anybody read the onion? Or maybe the Babylon Bee? Right? So, yeah, the Babylon Bee is so good. So this is satire. God is omniscient. God doesn't have to go look at this tower. He knows what's going on, but he wants to go down there so they can see. He can let them see how cool they are, right? So it's like there, there's an article in The Onion that came out this week. It was great. Talking about Lent. Notice what the article says. It says, Historians trace Catholic practice of eating fish on Fridays back to third century Long, Long John Silver's promotion. Right? Or how about this one I love. This is a Babylon Bee. This one really is good. Lego introduces new, sharper bricks that instantly kill you when you step on them. <laughs> Satire. Humor. It's funny. We can laugh about it. I think that's what God is doing here. God has a great sense of humor. And so God didn't need to go down and check out this tower. No. But he wants to, to um, humor them a little bit. I mean, this cattle, they were, this cat, um, this big old mound, this uh, ziggurat they were building, they thought it was amazing. But to Jesus, is a castle made of sand. Castle made of sand. And you know what Jimi Hendrix says about castles made of sand? They fall into the sea eventually, if you like Jimi Hendrix. So anyways, here in verse 5, we see this really cool thing. But also, th there's this thought that this is a, uh, a Christophany. In, in the Bible, you see Theophanies and Christophanies, and that's when God comes down to the earth in the Old Testament. And many scholars think this is a Christophany. We see Jesus actually comes down to see this tower, to, to be there, to um, kind of check it out. And then you see this in verse 6. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they have all one language, and this is only the beginning of what they will do, and nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. So what does that mean? I mean, is God looking at it going, saying, well, now they're too strong. We, we have to do something about it? There's a lot of debate on what this actually is, is saying here. Um, but, but one of the, the, the things that, that many scholars feel that God is saying that if we don't intervene, and now that they all speak one language, and now that they have completely rebelled and their pride has caused them to think that they are better than they are, that if we don't do something now, it's going to lead to another Genesis 5 and 6 moment. It's going to lead to them completely unraveling again. We have to do something now because they're getting way off course. They've already, they already said no, and they've moved in the wrong direction. We have to do something. We can't ignore what's going on, and we know what is best. And so God decides he has to move because God knows the power of wicked hearts banded together. And we know that too. Because all we have to do is look around at the atrocities of antebellum slavery or Nazi Germany or many of the things that are going on in the world to see the power of wicked hearts joined together who are prideful and who think they know better than God does. And so God says, we are going to intervene and we need to do something. And notice what he does. Look at verse 7. So God says, come, let us go down and confuse their language so they may not understand one's speech. So I want you to notice something. The Tower of Babel is actually not the, more, the most important part of this story. 
The, the, the Tower of Babel is, is what you might read in your kids' children's Bibles. It might be uh, one of the, of the fun stories we tell at camp. But the Tower of Babel is not the hinge point of the story. The hinge point of the story is the fact that sinful, broken hearts think they know better than what God does. And because of their pride, they say, we're going to do what, our, what we want. And God says, no. God says, instead, I'm going to intervene. I'm going to do what needs to be done to get you guys back on the course that you need to be on. But here's the truth. God intervenes. And when God intervenes, there's a consequence for their sin. And that consequence for their sin is their language. I want you to notice something. Look back at verse 1. Flip back just up a few verses to verse 1. Notice this. What does God tell us? In verse 1, he says, Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. One language. So, so let's play this out. So God creates Adam and Eve. We see in Genesis chapter uh, 1, he creates mankind. And in chapter 2, he gives Adam the job to name all of the animals, right? So we, we see there that God created Adam and Eve fully uh, intelligent, highly articulate, educated people who had the ability to speak. God creates them with language. Adam and Eve didn't create language. God created language. And there was one language starting in Genesis chapter 1. One language heading to the flood, and now that Noah's grandkids are having babies and having babies and having babies, there's still just one language. What does that mean? So I think it means that God's initial intention in the garden was to create us with one common language. But we see that the consequence of their sin and rebellion and prideful hearts was that we have now had our languages confused, and now we have over 7,000 of them. You know, it's interesting. This week, do some studies on modern linguistics. Modern uh, linguists have done a lot of studies to determine how do we get language. And so there, there's a lot of theories out there. And we don't have time to talk about them. But an evolutionary theory was that it developed over thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of years. And it just slowly, it slowly changed. And then we do know that the way language does morph, right? We see that slang happens. We see that languages do shift. Just look at old English. Like things do change, but what modern linguistics are finding is that language is actually hardwired into our brains. They studied over uh, the course of, of multiple languages, and what they found out that there are characteristics within all of those languages that hold to the same. We all have patterns. We all use simile and metaphor. We all have synonyms. And so what modern ling linguists are saying is that that. Language couldn't have developed by just a series of grunts and noises that came together to create words because language works in whole complex systems. So the aha moment is God created language. Language comes from God, and God gave us the intention of one language. And the reason that we have 7,000 of them was because of the rebellion of sinful hearts. It's the consequence of sin that we have so many languages. And that's why when you go on a mission trip, you have trouble communicating. And that's why when you go into a restaurant, a, a, you know, a restaurant with a unique menu that only speaks French, you're going to have trouble knowing what you're going to order. It's, it's beautiful how God uses language, but it's actually the consequence of pride and sin that we have so many languages. But, but what we can see is that language is this beautiful thing that God created. And because of that, we, we can look and see that language has been hardwired in our brains. Some really fun stories, just a side note. Some really funny stories of people who um, maybe get sick or get in an accident and they wake up with foreign accent syndrome. Have you guys heard of this? So like somebody might get, uh, get sick and they wake, or, or get in a car accident and, and they're, they're American and they wake up and they're speaking in a British accent or they're speaking in a German accent. But there's even stories, and we've got one here in the room today. You should ask Rich Garcia sometime of his story. Rich was in a really um, serious road bike accident, and when he woke up, and Rich may, may knew a little bit of Spanish, a few, uh, a few statements, but Rich woke up in the hospital and had a full conversation in Spanish with a nurse, never speaking Spanish before. I think God has hardwired us to know language. Language comes from God, and so we see now the consequence of our sin and rebellion is that our languages have been changed, and this has made things very difficult. For us because of that reason. But God knew it's what he needed to do to intervene and to set things back on course. 
Now, look back here. So God, God is saying we're going to go change their, we're going to go change their language so that, that we're going to confuse them so we can get things back on course and notice what he does. Remember, God's call to Adam, or to Adam and Eve and to Noah and his grandkids was to go and scatter, have babies, and fill the earth. Notice what happens in verse 8. So the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of the earth, and they left off building the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel, which means confusion, the less less. It's called Babel because there the Lord confused the languages of all the earth. And from there, the Lord dispersed them over the face of all the earth. So God confuses their languages and then they scatter. Now, we don't know what this looks like. We can speculate, which we will do heavily on the podcast this week. So feel free to tune in for some great theological speculations on how this happened. But what we do know is God confuses our language. So just imagine us in here in this group, God confuses our language. What do you do? Well, you probably go and try to figure out who speaks the same language you do. And so maybe that's how that worked. They went and tried to figure out who spoke the same language that they did. And then slowly they realized, okay, God, your plan is right. We're going to move on. And they scatter all over the earth. Now, what does that look like? Because that's interesting, right? How did people get to um, North America, South America, all to you know, New Zealand, all these places? And so there's a lot of theories and we don't have time to talk about them today. Did, did they slowly just move? Did they go, whew, did God just snap his fingers and now they're all over the place? Was this Pangea and they started to move and God moves tectonic plates? We don't know. But what we do know is the reason that we have people all over the world today all goes back to God confusing their language so that they would scatter. But it shows us God's plan. See, God has a plan. And God's plan for the world was beautiful people all over the globe and God's going to accomplish that plan, whether we got on board or not. In this case, they didn't. And God moved them on his own. But here's the truth. And as we, as we wrap up our time and as uh, we'll get ready to invite the band back on stage, here's the truth that I want us to take home from Genesis chapter 11. Is that God has a plan for this world and God has a plan for you and for your life. And God wants you to follow his way to accomplish his plan but if you don't, if you, if you allow pride to sneak in and cause you to lead and follow your own way, then God's going to accomplish his plan. He just may not use you to do it. God's going to use somebody else because God's always going to accomplish his plan. Take this home. God gives us the free will to make decisions, but God will always move to accomplish his purpose. See, there's a reality forefront that I want us to take home is that God didn't create us to be robots. God created us and gave us free will. You see that in the garden. God could have swooped down and knocked that apple out of, out of Eve's hand, or not apple, the papaya or pineapple or, you know, whatever, whatever it was. He could have swooped in and knocked it out of her hand, but he didn't. He allowed Eve to make that decision. God could have, as soon as the, the flood happened and, and they, Noah's grandkids started having babies, God could have moved them to the edge of the earth, but he didn't. God wants to give us the chance to say yes. God wants to give us the chance to follow him. So he gives us free will. But running right alongside that through what we see in the world and through the pages of Scripture is that God is sovereign. So God gives us free will to choose and make decisions, but God is sovereign, and he will accomplish his plan. And God will accomplish what he knows needs to be done. So the question for us is, are we going to follow God's way, or are we going to follow our own? Because what pride does is pride's like shining a spotlight. Or flashlight. See, when pride sneaks in, what we do is we take that flashlight and we turn it on ourselves. And pride causes me to think that I know what's best. And I know what's better for me and my life than God does. And pride ends up leading us down a place where we begin to discredit what God wants in our life and we completely miss what God is calling us to do. And the reason why it goes all the way back to Jeremiah 17 verse 9. Where Jeremiah, where, where, where through Jeremiah, God says this. God says that the heart is deceitful above all else and desperately sick. Who can understand it? My heart will always want me to take this flashlight and instead of pointing it up to God or pointing it on you, to point it on me, to say how great I am, to make a name for myself. And it's because my heart is broken and it's fractured and it's cracked and I can't fix my heart on my own. The only way we can learn to fight pride and to trust God's plan in our life is to learn to, to, to do that, is to get a new heart. 
And that's what God came and Jesus came to do for us. I love what Ezekiel 36, 26 says. He says, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And friends, when Jesus came, when Jesus came, he should have had the spotlight on him because he was the son of God who created the world. But instead, Jesus came and he turned and pointed that spotlight on us. And he went to the cross and gave his life for us so we can have life. And when we put our faith in Jesus, when we say yes to Jesus, does that mean we won't struggle with pride? No, pride is there. It's a thorn in the flesh we're always going to deal with. But it, it means that we now have a new heart and the power to fight pride by taking that flashlight and taking it off of us and turning it back on God. I want to invite the, the band back on stage, the worship team back on stage as we close. And I want to share a quote with you from Carl Henry. And notice what Carl says. He says that you cannot be arrogant when you stand next to the cross. When we reflect on the cross, we are best able to assess ourselves in light of God's holiness. So forefront, I want you to ask yourself this week. We've all got a flashlight in our hand. What are we pointing it at? Are we pointing that flashlight at ourselves? Or are we pointing it at God? Because the reality is, every day you have the choice of where you're going to point your flashlight. And if you keep pointing it on yourself, you're going to find out that you're miserable, that your decisions are continually leading you in the wrong direction, and that you're missing God's plan for your life. But when we make the decision to begin pointing that flashlight on Jesus and on the cross, it's then and only then that we realize that we have the power to fight pride and keep Jesus at the center of our affections and our efforts and keep Jesus great in our lives. So that's my challenge for you this week. And if you want, go home and get a flashlight and carry it around with you to remind you. Or get one of these little fancy doodads you can just put on your keychain. Where are you pointing your flashlight? This week, are you pointing it at yourself? Or are you pointing it to Jesus? So here, here in a second forefront, as the rest of the band comes back on stage, I, I want to just lead us in a moment of, of prayer. See, I think, I think some of us in this room today might be in a place where we maybe not have realized it, but we've been building Tower of Babels. We've been building Tower of Babels at work. We've been building Tower of Babels at home with our families or in our homes. Our house has become a Tower of Babel. Where has pride caused you to build your tower? And what do we need to lay at the feet of Jesus today? I want to create a moment here, here as we pray to just be honest with God. Let's just sit in the quiet for a second. If you're at home, I invite you to do this with us. In home on a, on a snowy day, I invite you just to, to sit back and, and quiet your heart and your mind. And let's ask God to stir us and to point us to where we've allowed pride to get in the way, to think that our way is better than God's way. And then let's take that and let's lay that at Jesus' feet. And let's ask him to, to take it away and ask him to help us to turn our flashlights to him.